Hello and welcome to IEDP Developing Leaders. I'm Roddy Miller and I'm here with two senior members of MIT faculty, Dr. Phil Budden and Professor Fiona Murray. Phil and Fiona are both members of the TIES group, which stands for Tech Innovation and Entrepreneurship and Strategy um, at MIT Sloan in Boston. But you're, we're clearly not in Boston today, we're in the center of London. And both of you are in fact Brits, so uh, welcome back here uh, to IEDP Developing Leaders. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone's talking about the need for innovation in organizations, but um, can you remind us why it's important, mm -hmm. m more important perhaps now than ever before? So I think for us, we'd like to step back and just uh, first define innovation. So we have a process definition, not a technology definition of innovation. So we define innovation as the process of taking ideas all the way from inception through to impact. And we think of ideas as being a match between a problem and a solution. And so what we see today is that there are many, many organizations who really need to solve big, important problems. And so innovation is really going to be uh, the driving force behind doing that. If I'm in a corporation, I need to think about innovating so that I have more competitive advantage to solve new and different problems uh, that my customers might face. Uh, if I'm in government, I want to solve important problems that are going to really help me uh, develop the country or the region that matters to me. If I'm in a university, I want to make sure I spend public money uh, on solving big important problems and challenges. Uh, and is that not, um, has that not always been the case? Or are we finding because of shifts in digitalization and, and the way that the you know, economy moves at the moment that that's becoming more of an issue? I think there are two forces. One is creating more opportunity because the pace of technological change and therefore the solution space is becoming larger and larger. Mm -hmm. And much of that solution space being digital means that there are more technological tools that you can deploy against your problems. I think the other is more of a, a sort of imperative, especially for large mm -hmm. corporations, because there are a lot of startups who are really innovating, who are absolutely configured to optimize their innovation activities. And so if I'm a large corporation, I really need to think about that so that I keep up and I use that momentum to actually continue to solve my customers needs and problems. Okay, uh, I mean I know you like to distinguish between capital I innovation and, and small I innovative behavior. Can you explain to us what you know, the key difference is between those? Sure, uh, thanks Roddy. Um, I think it's really important with the MIT definition seeing innovation as a process that everybody can find themselves somewhere on that spectrum of innovation from little I to, to big I. Now, big I innovation is what often people imagine with innovation. It's out at the frontier. It's aiming at some sort of 10x impact. It's often associated with startups. And that's an important part of innovation, but it's not the whole story. And if in large organizations they assume that's the only form of innovation, they're missing an awful lot of benefits from uh, little I innovation. We think of little I innovation as using some of the same tools and techniques as the transformational startups at the capital I frontier but are much more possible to achieve in large organizations, whether they're public sector or private sector. It's about adapting to technologies, uh, adapting organizational structure. It's not about inventing new technologies, but it's about changing uh, business processes and the way people work together. And so by having a spectrum from little I innovation to capital I, from 10% changes out to the 10X, we think most organizations can find themselves somewhere on that spectrum and it's way too important to be good at innovation to just leave it to, to the frontier innovation. Okay, but I mean, does that mean that people should be perhaps focusing more on the, on the, the little I, the, the sort of lots of 10% um, rather than going for the big projects, or does it not work like we, that? We often talk about this as a portfolio, and organizations need to think about where they're going to make their investments on the innovation spectrum. The benefit of the 10% is it's a, an, an incremental form of innovation, but still a, an honorable type, which is a great place to start if the organization, for a variety of reasons, organizational, cultural, its history, hasn't been as innovative as it wants to be. It's a great place to start. They don't need to be sort of jumping in with both feet to try and achieve just 10x. Mm -hmm. And yet organizations need to be thinking about their portfolio of investments, of mm -hmm. staff time, of resource, on that spectrum. So 10% is a great place to start, but they should be thinking about investments out through the spectrum of that particular portfolio. And I know you've got a sort of graphic representation of, the, of mm -hmm. this, which uh, plots the novelty of the problem against mm -hmm. the novelty of the solution. Um, do, you, do you want to explain to people how that works and, and the importance mm -hmm. of that? 
Yes, so as I said, we think about innovation and ideas as a match between a problem and a solution. And so if you could think about along the x-axis, how novel is the solution? So is it something that's quite similar to things that we've already deployed? Or is it really, really new? So it's some mm -hmm. transformative new material, um, you know, it's a new algorithm and what have you. So that would be the x-axis. If we think about the y-axis, we're really thinking about how new is the problem? So what are the new kinds of functionalities and challenges that we're really going to try and solve for our customer? If we're right out in the top right-hand corner, this is the sort of um, 10x that Phil talks about, we're basically often trying to develop and deploy completely new solutions to quite new problems, problems and challenges that we might never have had before. Uh, think of drone navigation, for example. We didn't know, before we had drones, we didn't know we needed to know how to navigate them. Um, but we might also be thinking, we go right back into the bottom left-hand corner about incremental, slightly new solutions to problems that we either understand very well or slightly adapted problems. And then we get all the sort of range of activities across that map in between. Lots of organizations, when they think about innovation, get quite obsessed with new solutions. So they think about this just as R&D. But what often causes big organizations, I think, to uh, stumble is when they don't recognize that there are actually also new problems and new challenges that their customers are facing, and they need to match those two things together. Okay. And I know that um, one of the sort of part of your core thinking around this is that you know, innovation occurs out of ecosystems. Um, and you reference the fact that in 2005, Thomas Friedman published his book on the world is flat, which suggested that it didn't really matter where you were, mm -hmm. there was no opportunity was possible you know, for anyone and everyone. Uh, but, but I think you dispute that to an extent, and that you think there's a sort of, mm -hmm. uh, th there are mixes or recipes um, which make some places better than others. Tom Friedman's book, The World is Flat, was uh, a really important book and it implied that with uh, digital technologies and the internet the world was going to be flat, anything could happen anywhere. And I think we've seen effectively over the last 15 years that that's not the case, that certain places on the planet have been better at this kind of innovation. We think of Silicon Valley, Boston's Kendall Square, London, Israel, Singapore, so places around the world but it hasn't happened evenly. And this drives our research. In a world that's supposed to be flat, why is this kind of innovation-driven entrepreneurship uh, so focused in certain places? So we've tried to understand why it's happening in some places and not another. And the term we use to describe that is an ecosystem, mm -hmm. that certain ecosystems have the range of stakeholders, and those stakeholders engage with a range of assets that actually allows them to achieve much better results. So we spend uh, a lot of our team working with regions from around the world uh, to understand what are their assets, how can they be better. Uh, you don't want to copy existing ecosystems, you don't want to try and copy Silicon Valley. You need to be authentic to what you've got, um, but then understanding how do you pull those stakeholders together uh, within that rather organic ecosystem. I mean, sitting here in London, are the clear things that London offers which perhaps you know, other locations are less good at? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, I mean, London is definitely up there as one of the world's leading innovation ecosystems. Uh, I think it has a tremendous wealth of talent, and so the human capital that we have in London that is very international talent is extremely, extremely important. It also has some areas where it specializes, so for example, in uh, the financial sector, insurance, and so on, sort of broadly defined, as well as in creative media, advertising, uh, and healthcare. And so there are certain areas in London where if you were thinking about, from a global point of view, where would you go if you wanted to access an ecosystem that's highly, highly specialized around fintech and financial services, London, I think, would be a very obvious mm -hmm. location. If you were thinking about it in the creative media space, you'd probably think about London as well. But the underlying asset base, I think, is a lot about the human capital and really a culture of innovation that has been on the resurgence in London over the last decade. I mean, if we were to explore that a bit further, I mean, if you are in a business which has strong ties to somewhere which isn't in an innovation hotspot. What are your options? What are, mm -hmm. what, what are the things that you might possibly do? Sure. Well, one of the things we like to teach in our global uh, education process is some companies are connected to particular ecosystems and we think there are insights from the world's best ecosystems about what you can do. So, for example, we've worked with the Ose Pay company out of Morocco about what it can do there, pulling stakeholders and assets together. 
uh, we've worked with uh, a team out of London and a lot of companies will come to London because of the enduring strengths of London as an innovation ecosystem. But we've also worked with other parts of the United Kingdom, uh, Scotland and Wales, uh, Leeds city region, and we help them work out what is their comparative advantage. So our message about innovation is really a message of hope. There are some world-class innovation ecosystems, but by using these MIT insights, we think there are ways of helping any innovation ecosystem to be better by bringing these stakeholders together and assessing the assets that they have. Um, so if we're to look at the stakeholder model, which you have those five main elements to it, if you're weak in one of them, or if you perceive that that's the area of weakness, are you best to try and focus on strengthening that, or do you build on your strengths? It's that, that whole dilemma, really. Yes. I think that you have to do both. So I think in, in areas where you are, so the five stakeholders that are important are obviously the, the corporates and the government, uh, the entrepreneurs and risk capital and the universities. And so it's those five stakeholders together. Uh, in regions where one of those is weak, it's certainly important to strengthen that. But if you were to try and strengthen it across the board in every sector, in every type of technology, in every discipline, uh, you would have uh, faced, I think, both a very inefficient and a very uphill challenge. And so the way in which we tend to work with regions is to have them think about how to strengthen uh, the weak elements, but in particular areas of comparative advantage. And then to strengthen the links and networks among the different stakeholders. What's the role of, for government in, in this? I mean, clearly, government's one of those stakeholder parts, sure. but it, it, uh, it sets you know, the tone to, to a large extent and, and, and the, the structure. It, it really does. Government is one of the key five stakeholders in the MIT model, and it's often overlooked, um, particularly in the United States, where government's just told to get out of the way. It turns out that within this type of innovation, government has a really important role to play. It's not always the role that government thinks it has. So one of the reasons we have the five stakeholders engage is so that government can hear from the entrepreneurs and the corporate enterprises and the universities, mm -hmm. what is it they really need to improve the ecosystem? But government does an awful lot to set the basic rules, both for innovation, funding, R&D, um, but also on the entrepreneurship side, making it easy to set up enterprises and startups, but then really thinking through whether what it's doing is strengthening the ecosystem. Does it have an approach where government departments can procure from uh, startups? Is it making it as possible for those who want to provide risk capital to put in seed investments and angel investing? It's not all about venture mm -hmm. capital. So there's no uh, one answer fits all. We think that's the uniqueness of the individual ecosystem is to pull it together, but government's a really important player to have at the table, but it's only one of five voices. What are the challenges for very large, heavily structured organizations um, in trying to put in place a new innovative uh, ethos and, and, and mm -hmm. atmosphere mindset? Uh, because clearly when we think, I mean, I think most people when they think of innovation, they think of small startups of mm -hmm. groups of 20 somethings. Um, and if you've got a, a big, if you've got a, a, you know, a big already sure. uh, existing organization, how, how can you start to put some magic sauce onto that to create mm. innovation? Innovation is really important even for and perhaps especially for large organizations. Often uh, it's hard for them and particularly if they th think innovation is this sort of 10x crazy startup entrepreneur out at the frontier, it's hard for a well-established organization to achieve that kind of agility and speed. Um, but it's really important for our large organizations and our large companies to find ways for their leaders to encourage innovation in their organizations, um, to unleash the sorts of corporate innovation that we think is really important, and in parts of the, the corporation to have corporate entrepreneurship to actually encourage people to do this. And we think it's one of the leadership challenges. Um, many of the uh, senior leaders we meet in the private sector are really interested in achieving innovation in their organization. It's what the CEO or the chairman or the board is telling them to do. And yet what we try to do is help them understand how can they authentically do that uh, and share with them some of the challenges we know they're going to run into. So don't try to be a 10x startup entrepreneur. Think about realistically what could 10% corporate innovation be like. It's much more than just Six Sigma continuous improvement. That should be just part of business as usual. It requires an innovative mindset. It requires you to address your organization and your culture to make sure you're optimizing it. And there's a real role for leadership. Even if the senior leaders personally don't feel that they are the most entrepreneurial, innovative, or tech savvy people in their organization, there's a role for those leaders to create the permission space 
to encourage innovation, put guardrails around it so they don't run into problems, but it's really important to have leadership find a way to take forward innovation authentically. And is that something that can be done relatively quickly? Have you seen it in organizations, in big organizations being put in place quickly, or is it always going to be a, a gradual, mm. slow process? I think it takes time. But I do think, and to pick up on some of uh, the, the comments that Phil has made, we know that creating that permission space, so we know that creating the permission space for experimentation as a way of testing new things, uh, seeing what happens, learning, and then sort of adapting and updating is incredibly important. And that permission space for small experiments can actually be established in an organization reasonably quickly. Mm. It actually takes a lot of discipline and effort, though, to maintain that, so that if something goes wrong, if something is not as successful uh, as you might like it to be, that you don't immediately stop and say, well, that was a disaster, let's not do that anymore. Uh, and so we try to banish uh, failure. We think about that as the F word mm -hmm. uh, that probably isn't as helpful, but rather to think about experimentation and learning. And I think establishing that space for experimentation and learning can actually be done quite quickly. To actually spread that out into the right part of the organization uh, can take more time. And it does require this very long-term senior commitment uh, because it's really when you start to get that experimentation engine going uh, that you really start to have cultural change over a long period of mm -hmm. time. I think we also find that our ecosystem approach, where large organizations are working with smaller uh, entrepreneurial startups and others in the innovation ecosystem, can be a place where you can test out and you can learn new ways of being and new kinds of cultures. And you can do that also reasonably quickly. Um, I mean, it's interesting that focus on culture, because uh, presumably the culture is inevitably going to take a, a t time to change, evolve, mm -hmm. bed in. Uh, so the balance between culture and structure within organizations. Do you have a, a sort of an idea of which is more important? I mean, both, clearly both have, have their place, but is, does one, do you think, have more of an impact on, than the other? So I think the three lenses model mm. might be a helpful window into this. What do you think? Yes. So MIT has an approach to uh, organizations and their cultures, and it sees both culture and structure as really important, and it encourages people to look at their organizations through three lenses, one of which is the blue lens for strategic design, which is rational, which is org charts, which is structures, and they can be easily changed on a whiteboard or a PowerPoint. Uh, secondly, the red lens, requi lens requires you to look through your organization as a sort of a competitive structure, where are the poles of power. And the third lens, the hardest one to look at, and one that we spend a lot of time on when we do custom work for clients, is understanding their culture. And the MIT approach from Ed Schein and Van Manen is really about taking a view at culture. It's something that can evolve over time mm -hmm. if you can see it. So nothing that you do is neutral when it comes to culture. You're either reinforcing a culture that is not friendly to innovation or you're starting to take the small steps, the experiments that Fiona mm -hmm. referred to, that allow you to start to send different messages, create different stories about your, your organizational culture. So to your question, Roddy, it's quite easy to change the structure and a lot of the organizations we go into have been trying to do this innovation thing for a while and not achieving this. Just tinkering with the structure is not itself going to be enough without also thinking about looking through uh, the, the culture lens at the organization, understanding what are the other barriers to achieve this. And it's really important that large organizations get good at innovation. Uh, it's important for them, for their, their ongoing success and not getting uh, you know, disrupted by a startup. Um, but it's also really important to the ecosystems they're embedded in that they get on the right side of this innovation journey. So we're seeing it's really quite complex, the, the execution of putting innovation in or, or developing, fostering innovation in organizations. Um, but the big picture is, is, is fairly straightforward in, in what's trying to be achieved. Where can people come to find out more about it? Uh, with you and, and, and the programs that you run? We think it's really important to get these insights out in a way that executives and leaders can use. So through MIT Sloan's Executive Education, uh, we have a number of options. Uh, one of which is we have an in-person, on-campus two-day version called Innovation Ecosystems, how corporates can tap into the ecosystems. Uh, and then recently we released an online version, which is a six-week self-paced version focused on corporate innovation, which is about what you can do internally, but also uh, tapping the ecosystem. 
increasingly we're doing work uh, for customers on a customized basis in their organizations because when it comes to some of the structural and cultural issues it can be a much richer, a richer conversation if we're doing it inside the organizations but uh, execed is constantly uh, developing new offerings in this area so I encourage people to look at the Sloan execed website to see those courses that I've just mentioned but also others fantastic Deanna Murray Phil Bunn, thank you very much indeed thank you Roddy thank you